far off and deep in flowing time, before the storytelling, before the naming, the great meltdown of ice sculpted the hills and river valleys. Across millennia, there came the greening and the forests, a land of deer and wolf and bird, a land of bear, wild boar and salmon, and then, in time, footfall of man and the first boats upon the river. So, common sails, in a way, is a kind of a prayer almost. It's kind of a gut cry that those days of preeminence will come again. And as a corollary to that, well then, that everybody contributes to the sails coming again, to more prosperity coming again, to the greatness of his Waterford coming again. thought then was say no why not have a mass choir why not try and get in at the at the beginning of the thing which would be a very high profile and through a lot of work a lot of ear bending a lot of uh, how to say um, all sorts of contacts made with people calling in all sorts of favors we decided that yes we would go for something and out of all that again we decided yes look let's try and um, get a new piece for Waterford the enormous amount of goodwill towards this project was was fantastic, and it was there from the very beginning. You know, there was there was that leap of faith of people saying, "Look, if we, you know, we, we'll all pull together, we'll make it happen." There was a great moment. I, I remember early on when Niall Crowley said, "Well, maybe instead of just a poet and a composer, we should have one for each segment of the piece." And then this idea was born of the five poets and the five composers working together. And I remember Niall saying at the time that it would be like a Florentine hive of creative activity. And I thought that was a a really wonderful description and something really worth working for. You know, we we came together and started kind of trashing out this. And um, there was two ways of going about it. One, we picked one writer and one uh, composer. And that would have been the easy way to do it. And it was essentially going to be kind of five movements. So why not have five writers and five composers? Um, We had a young poet, Megan Nolan, who joined the group and worked with a composer called Ben Hanlon. And Megan was in the company of of really great, well-known poets, published poets, members of Ace Donna. And I'm sure that for her, it was probably nerve-wracking at some stage or another. And um, I remember feeling quite protective of her and and hoping she'd be okay and that she wouldn't worry about that because we all knew that she was well able for the project. And I'll never forget the day her email came through with her poem. And it was so tender and so beautiful and so inspiring. And I just thought, oh my God, this is an amazing moment and a beautiful collaboration. And she's brought something very special to it. So it was very interesting then when I got the poem uh, that Megan, that Megan Nolan uh, wrote, it was the very opening poem, so it was kind of like the beginning in a way of that kind of history, if you wish, of Waterford, or at least some sort of a starting point that Megan took up. Uh, and to be honest with you, it's a fabulous poem. So I think all of the images that I had of that girl coming on the boat and the swish of the water and the little child in her arms and the different voices kind of all being heard, like it was all in the poem. It wasn't hard to work with that poem, the opposite. In fact, it just would draw stuff out of you. It was was a very, very beautiful, very well-written poem and it evoked all sorts of thoughts. This is the first thing I've ever worked on in any kind of professional context and the fact that Obviously, the other poets involved are like incomparably more established than I am, and uh, I was worried about the fact that they had so much more experience than I did. So yeah, I think that that day that I that I kind of had that realization that I had to write it in in my own way was a, was a really nice moment for me to be able to to, to just kind of uh, give that to Ben. Um, so I would just send him my work as I as I got it done in increments, and then. 
then eventually I just threw it all at him when I'd finished it and he worked with what I gave him then, which was nice of him. <laughs> part in the work was uh, to write the text of a narrator's words, uh, comprising an introduction and then three sections of interlude narration between the other composers and poets' works. I was, I was writing four um, individual links, if you like, so um, they all obviously, while they're separate in time, there has to be a link from one to the next and uh, the river really literally runs through um, the, both the orchestration and maybe the rhythmic drive as you go along. And it was very interesting to see what a composer of her talents uh, would suggest by way of quite subtle uh, musical responses to the whole concept and also to the words which I had offered. I found the words to be very, very inspiring, as Michael said. Um, they sparked off specific timbres and, uh, we say, gestures in range that I just wanted to work with. So I just found that uh, very challenging. And I suppose, uh, yeah, personally, I had never in my life written music that separated. So, you know, that was a, a good challenge, I think, for me, something I'd never done before. I mean, a composer, again is, is a kind of a, a long, uh, it's a solitary activity composition. So you're in charge of the beginning, the middle and the end. So in a sense, um, that's taken away from you. So you've got different parameters to work in. And I've always liked to do different things in each piece that I write. So I found that a good personal motivation, if you like. <laughs> Italian composer Monteverdi in the 17th century, he famously said, prima le parole, poi la musica. First the words and then the music. The words will suggest ideas to the composer, as indeed Mark's words did to me. If I could read, um, for instance, the opening of the poem. He writes, magnificence of rigging above a mile of key. The city's face freshened by salt from every sea. New churches, new cathedrals, Christ glorified in stone. In Anne's lane a furnace and the first crystal blown. The theme of the work tying in with the tall ships was essentially the keys in Waterford. And what a pivotal element that has been in the city's life from the beginning of history, really, since the Vikings came. When I thought about it, um, what had happened in Waterford at that time, um, you would have had the, the glass factory coming into existence, you would have had all the shipping coming into the quay, um, you'd have had the cathedrals being built and churches, uh, you'd have had the first bridge um, being built. Um, and what, what I then kind of noticed, I suppose, thinking about that uh, was that there was, there was a sound um, running through that. You, you had river, there was a ri sound, there was river, there was crystal, there was rigging, there was bridge, there, there was a particular sound. The 
calico dress and calico wrapper. Under my feet, the swaying water. A pair of shoes, a bonnet trimmed, the promise of work a long way from here. Take needle and thread, a cap and a coat. The tide goes in and the tide goes out. Um, then when Peter sent me some of the lyrics, it was, it, it was just terrific to find out that he had, even though we had discussed it previously, we hadn't given one another a definite direction. And his lyrics seemed to focus around the voice of the emigrant and almost reciting um, the, the list of objects they were taking with him. So there was, there was a haunting loneliness about that and there was a, a bittersweet, both the excitement of the voyage and what was remaining behind as um, a, a sadness at having to leave. Greg, I think he worked with the, the mood of the piece um, and he, he, he worked on kind of coming up with a setting based on um, the initial kind of, I suppose, um, verses of, of the poem and the sound of those, the sound of like the calico dress and the calico wrapper. So he was kind of playing very much with the sound of, of, of the words. And a really curious thing was that in the first lyrics that Peter gave, um, I was able to detect a rhythm pattern that had a triplet. Now, that might sound strange, and he actually sent me back a lovely email to say it was curious and interesting having a musical reading of the patterns within his lyrics. But it gave me a triplet feeling, um, and I was able to build on that for both the main theme and for the, the supporting work that the choir was doing. It then musically became a single voice with these tiny patterns of triplets behind, and for me, that was the single voyage, but the lapping of the water at the same time surrounding the, the initial message. Sue's music, Come the Sails, was is just you can just tell that she's she's talented at writing for kids and she know she works with children's choirs herself and well it was always important that children would get to be part of this project. There was going to be a specific part written for them in the finale. Well, any personal inspiration or inclination uh, that I might have had had to be tempered by the demands of the project. And at a meeting in uh, New Ross between my between Niall Crowley, the conductor of Sue Furlong, uh, and myself, Niall outlined to us what he wanted. And uh, I was to be involved with the fourth movement, the last movement. <clears throat> and for this, Niall said that... Um, he wanted a sense of finale, he wanted a sense of anthem, uh, and um, a sense of a theme of coming home to Waterford. Waterford is a modern international vibrant city. John is very prolific um, in, he, he has a, there's a lot, a lot of poetic uh, phrases just trip out of his mouth and I was listening and listening and listening and saying, an anthem, uh, how am I going to condense a lot of this material? Um, so I was quite worried, quite worried for a while until I sat down and trawled through all, all, of, the, all of the material and, and I picked out phrases, basically. So um, John was so, so helpful on that score. He, he, and then he was the one who, who brought it all together and gelled it for me in the end, you know. Well, it was Susan's picking of the line from the very first draft that I did, come the sails we only dreamed of. And uh, she liked that line a lot. And in a way, this set the tone and provided a focus for the movement, as well as the eventual overall title. Uh, there was a dimension that there was a children's choir 
as part of all of this. And I know Sue's worry was that um, in the drafts I was doing, that some of the words just might pass over their heads. So I had to factor in the fact that there was a children's choir, you know, performing as part of this. And um, the work of Enid Blyton came to mind, the famous five. And um, the roles involved in adventures. The famous five are a favourite reading of my own kids. <clears throat> I know that came a phrase, um, stowaways to the future. Stowaways to the future. Stowaways to the future. Where does your stay? Where does your stay? The sails we only bring now. Let's again the bleeding tide. Music is about performing and it's about it's about airing what people compose, that, that creative side of it is getting it out there and performing. And the product was incredible, but the process was what was most amazing for me. And the memories of the faces uh, of the choir during rehearsal. When you have 230 or 40 people up in front of you and they're singing their heart and soul out and afterwards once they stop and they're all beaming it's unbelievable and they didn't get all to see that they maybe felt that but they didn't get to see that and I got to see that you know numerous times over the course of the process so I think for me the kind of fondest memory was kind of that sense of golly the people that were involved in this were incredible so that's my memory